A warm welcome to all of you to this hopefully um, mind-boggling afternoon. This is part of a week which has, so far, we are halfway into the week, has been the most mind-boggling week in my academic career. I hope it will continue like that. Warm welcome to this meeting, which is um, part of a Pufendorf initiative, a Pufendorf Institute theme. A very short background to what we are talking about. It goes back about 10,000 years. Once upon a time, people started to shift from hunting and gathering food to grow crops. And they domesticated annual grasses, the grasses that we still live on. Wheat, barley, rye, maize, after some time, rice and so forth. The Neolithic Revolution lasted for a long, long time, something like 10,000 years. And it took to about 1970s that somebody said, there is a problem of still relying on these annual grasses. Many, if not all, at least many of the problems we see in modern agriculture can be actually traced back to the fact they were using annual grasses that needs to be uprooted once a year. Many of the social problems of agriculture are also stemming from the fact that we are so dependent on annual crops. So it was Wes Jackson, who's sitting over there, who came with this fantastic idea. It took 10,000 years for humanity to come up with such a great idea. And said, we should domesticate perennial grasses, or forbs, or legumes, as a staple food crop instead. And he said, it will take some time, it will take at least 50 years, but maybe we can do it within 100 years, which is a very short time compared to the 10,000 years we have been practicing and, 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 and um, um, breeding the annuals. And for that, he got the so-called Alternative Nobel Prize in 2010, the Right Livelihood Award, and that's also the reason why this link with Lund University is. Because Lund University is part of the International Right Livelihood uh, College Network. So Wes Jackson's idea st started to grow in Kansas. Um, it has spread, it has grown. And at the moment, I think this map is already a bit obsolete, where we have, on this map, we have about 40 plus research organizations around the world trying to, sort of helping out with this um, transition. And I think it's, it's a mistake if people think that this is just another crop. It is an absolutely profound change and transformation of not only agriculture and the way we get our food, but also of institutions and even our mindsets. That's what we have been discussing so far this, this week. Anything from genetics, plant physiology, to perenniality in our mindset, thinking about food, agriculture, and so forth. So this is a collaboration between Lund, Institute, uh, Lund University, the Land Institute, and in the middle we have the Right Livelihood College who made this possible. Um, and we have to say that this is done within the Pilfendorf Institute, which is this fantastic place where scholars are given the time to sit and just talk and discuss without thinking about deliverables, disciplinary boundaries, or anything like that. So that's what we have been doing. We have been people from, from the humanities, from the natural science, social science, economics, and we have two magnificent guest researchers that we have been able to, to bring to Lund for a month, and you will hear them talking here very, very soon. It's Tim Cruz, who will be the second speaker uh, this afternoon, who is the research director of the Land Institute, and we have Professor Emerita, Harriet Friedman from University of Toronto in Canada will talk to us. Um, an undertaking like this 
is not just driven by ideas. We also need some funding. So we are very grateful for um, particularly the Land Institute, and who has brought not only much of their expertise and their people, but also a substantial amount of funds to make this possible. But also, we are very grateful to the Axe Foundation. We have a representative here in the middle. Thank you, Madeline, uh, for helping out to, to fund this, this event. And also the LMK Foundation, Lars Mikael Carlson Foundation, who also is responsible for funding the guest professors here. So um, this is important, I think. So before coffee, there will be two, two talks. Harriet Friedman will give us a history, a long history, and primarily a long social history about agriculture and food outlining some of the problems. Tim will talk about the ecological problems we have faced and we have created, and also indicate that there might be a grand solution, a bright future. Then there will be coffee and tea. And then after that, we will hear some of the most promising research results that now start to show us that what Wes Jackson talked about in 1977, and most people thought was a complete utopia, that utopia, we can actually start to think that, hmm, it isn't an utopia any longer. There is a real potential that this can become reality within the next couple of years, 10 years, 20 years perhaps. But we can already now start by scaling up the research from the labs and the small test areas to entire farms, networks of farms, and start to involve people interested in creating new forms of food, what kind of market channels will there be, and so forth. That will be in the afternoon. And we will also have talks about the much more social and humanitarian changes that a perennial agriculture might bring. So, without further ado, I would like to invite Harriet Friedman, who is a distinguished soci professor sociologist, who really is the pioneer of studying food systems, global food systems, from a political and a social perspective. And that's it, I suppose. Harriet. The floor is yours. Uh, Leonard, water. <laughs> thank you. Um, lunch was very salty. So <laughs> thank you all for being here. Thank you to Leonard for the introduction and to the Pufendorf Institute. And it's really, and everyone else involved, it's a, a great honor to be invited to give this lecture. Um, so, let me start with the microcosm of where we are now. Um, I found this on the internet, Save the Earth, it's the only planet with hamburger. And uh, one of the ways I have had of going into this, I won't do it in this talk, except a little bit, is to ask, well, how did we get to the point where everybody in the world knows about and many want to eat these little patties of beef between two pieces of bread. Uh, because we know that this diet, especially for the poor, I have two, do I have a pointer? No. I have two meals there because we've come to the point where we have different diets for the rich and the poor. To some extent that was always true. It's just that the rich ate more meat or ate better cuts or something. But now we have truly different diets where the industrial diet, we can call it, uh, is the diet for the poor. Uh, meanwhile, um, for a very long time, uh, and still, in many parts of the world, though under stress almost everywhere, uh, people like this group in the um, Andes um, have a pretty decent diet. They're considered poor because they're measured to have uh, less than a dollar or two dollars a day. Uh, but the people who are forced into the city and have to compete with us uh, with one or two dollars a day may not be doing better than they are. <laughs> 
So this kind of food or diet has uh, produced two different kinds of landscapes. I'll go over the history of monoculture very briefly, very schematically in a moment, but just say that the most recent monoculture of a transplanted species that was fine in its original site of domestication and many years of cultivation in West Africa, uh, this is a picture from um, Gabon, uh, of, of commercializing it within the framework of the mixed farming system. But the other picture is deforestation, and I will have pictures of what is put there in place, which are basically perennial monocultures of palm trees that are used. Does, who know, does everyone know what palm, that's used for, palm oil, that we started growing in this massive way? only 25 years ago, really, we, somebody, uh, they're used for processed food and cosmetics. So this is the way we have come, this is how far we've come, uh, but very recently, and so I'm arguing that we don't have that much of a challenge to get somewhere else to change direction. So most of what I'm going to say today is um, an exploration of how we got here. So this is the only place I'm going back really far, and that is the domestication of meat of, of wheat uh, in the Middle East, and point out that its movement as far west as Great Britain, as far east as China, was a, a joint movement of people and plants, and that that still goes on, but something has changed, which I will get to. Uh, cattle, the same thing, except they have their own feet, and so they moved, and it's probably a more mutualistic, although there's an argument that grain was a mutualistic co-domestication with humans as well. Uh, they moved themselves and became more diverse, of course, as they uh, entered into the farming and cultural and food systems of different parts of the world. And we have prehistoric evidence or sometimes uh, ancient evidence of cattle. So let me start by saying that even after the growth of civilization, as we call it, meaning cities, hierarchies, literacy, um, some few other things, <laughs> separation of uh, farmers from um, the other, from urban dwellers often and from literate uh, people and professionals, that they started colonies, but they started them in a way that's quite different from what we now experience. And it's worth noting that as a phase in the movement of people and plants together from one place to another. Um, ancient Greek settler colonies, and if you look at the map there, uh, they were contiguous and within a similar um, climatic uh, eco-region, bio-region. Um, and all of this 800 to 500 BCE. And what they did when they moved, well, there were Neolithic people in, in Sicily, for instance, in many of these places. They would displace them. They would absorb them into the population. And in any case, they would certainly, whatever happened to those people, and that's important, but still, they would establish a Greek culture that was similar to the one that they carried with them. And that culture, of course, means agriculture. Uh, the way we use the land, or the way they use the land, and the way it related to food, to commerce, to trade, to social relations uh, that grow out of that. So in each place, they would have wheat, they would have barley, they would have cattle, they would have olives and wine. And this was the what we call the Mediterranean complex. So it was settlement, um, very different from what the Romans did, but I'm not going to go into that because the Romans did something that didn't happen again until the empires after 1500. I will go into that, but first I want to say um, and raise it as a question to people here about the origins of our problem, because that's important, the, t the chronological origins. When? When did all the, the problems start? It's really important how we think about the solutions and how despairing or positive we can be about what's 
possible. And I'm going to start with English high farming. That is the beginning of what we think of as scientific farming, scientific breeding, county fairs and competition for the best grain, the best cattle, uh, the best vegetables, all of it. Uh, that began in England, uh, we usually say, with what we usually call the agricultural revolution in around 1750, 1780. And What's important about it, most of us have learned in school about the enclosures, which was the foundation for this, uh, and most of us learned, quite rightly, that it was a terribly exploitative uh, practice. It's still going on. It's going on in Africa now. It's going on wherever there are massive seizures of land, and some of the same language is used, all of it. But what we don't usually learn is that it was pretty ecologically sustainable, and it was done within a framework of land holding, which it's worth remembering, not to replicate, but to bring forward some of the um, positive aspects. So the uh, ecologically, it was organized uh, large landowners uh, who legally were entailed, meaning they could not sell the land. Uh, they had to keep it the way that it, Hoogstadt, is that how I say, you say it? The, uh, the farm where they're experimenting with, um, with Kernza that we saw uh, a few days ago. That that kind of aristocratic land holding meant that the, um, the land could not be degraded in the same way, that it was going to be passed on to your descendants. And the language they used in England was to maintain the heart of the soil. That was the idea of centrally of what you were doing. Then they divided it up into farms. They rented the farms to farmers who would be scientific or high farmers. And those farmers had uh, could only have a scale that they could ride on a horse. They organized the whole landscape from north to south into arable um, farming and livestock areas. But in the livestock, in all of the areas, they mixed farming and grains, and they used the animals as a way of um, organizing the nutrient flows. And it was a reasonably sustainable system. Now, it had flaws in it that um, opened them up to problems, but that wasn't the main thing that happened. Uh, the main thing that happened was empire, and you will also have heard about the corn laws, or the abolition of the corn laws, which were protective tariffs uh, that protected the aristocracy. That The abolition of those corn laws really undermined this entire system um, in England, and similar things were happening in the other um, colonies, but England by this time was becoming the dominant empire as well. So what happened was that settlers were by choice or force, <laughs> moved uh, to new areas. Uh, and I'll talk about what those areas were in a moment, but I'll just name them now. And I'll say that the list is longer than what you probably remember. So North America, of course, Canada and the US, major grain areas, grain exporting areas now, and meat exporting areas as well uh, in the 19th century. Uh, Australia and New Zealand, you've heard of those. You've heard of Argentina. Um, I put them in the wrong order. I should have put Argentina first, because you've heard of that. And now southern Brazil, and now northern Brazil. But these were set up in this period. But also, the US Department of Agriculture considered the Punjab, uh, Western India, now part of Pakistan, as one of their major competitors in 1890. Um, the Danube Basin was also an area of new settlement. In Punjab, um, it had been uh, not able to be settled because of Afghan tribes. Long story that hasn't ended yet. Uh, but when it was uh, pacified by the British Empire, they were able to build a railway, bring settlers from other parts of India, and set up what is uh, commercially the most um, modern and industrial form of farming in India. In the Danube Basin, it was the competition area between the Russian Empire, the, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire. When they pushed out the Tatars, the indigenous people, or, or, or incorporated them politically, they were able to settle that, and they brought in settlers from northern Europe, many of whom were like Mennonites or Jews, unable to own land for legal reasons. They are, came and be, went modern farming. Those are my ancestors um, in um, Hungary. 
the Black Sea, similarly southern Russia, and of course the Trans-Siberian Railway. So the Russian Empire was building a railway and recruiting settlers from other parts of Russia to settle. So all of these areas were created in the same way in that period, that's what was happening. Railways were the major site of accumulation. People were being pushed off of land or wanted to go to places where they could get land. And they were recruited as settlers to organize, to settle in pieces of land divided up with no attention to the waterways, to the, to the, um, the landscape, uh, as part of a project of state building and state expansion. And in Canada and the U.S., it was competitive, where to set the border. So that's going to be an important part of the story later. So to make it more comprehensive than settlement, I want to argue that cities, as we now know them, um, modern cities, began in, an, in this way and in this period. And they began first as an imperial city, London, but I, could do, I did do the same thing for Lisbon, the Portuguese Empire, you can do this. So for the English, British Empire, uh, London as an imperial city grew up around the slave trade. It developed all kinds of financial uh, mechanisms like joint stock companies for slave ships, for enslaved Africans, younger sons that were not inheriting because of the entail system, went to become planters and slave owners in the Caribbean and, and in the U.S. South. Um, so what this did was it created, and sugar became important to the diet for the first time. It became an important source of calories, and it's still with us and a problem. So that people being driven off the land in England and into London, which was not at all industrial, we couldn't get jobs, they had to have stuff to eat. And what they got was sugar, they got gin, uh, they got other things that were made out of surpluses through the process of reorganization, and they became very undernourished. It, it was the beginning of that, of that process. That sugar, of course, was being produced by slaves in rather, it depends where, but especially in Cuba, in very industrial forms of production, not fossil-driven, but a technical division of labor, very specific, very time-driven, very hierarchical, uh, before it happened in what we call the Industrial Revolution in England. So the important point here is that the social and spatial distances that severed human experiences of what was being eaten and what was being grown and who was doing it and where. So that inter intimate interdependence, which had basically existed even in the Greek colonies, is now severed. And that will continue in new, uh, new ways. Slave trade, of course, completely disorganized uh, parts of West Africa where the young people were taken out. And uh, the ones who made it became the slaves in these plantations. In 1780, we got the first industrial city, and many came up very much sooner. And one thing that's really important to understand is the relation between industry and agriculture is very intimate here in terms of its, its origin, of its genealogy. That the Industrial Revolution in England didn't happen just in Manchester. It happened, Manchester itself was formed out of many little villages, unlike London. And those many little villages uh, merged and people were drawn into them to be workers, not only by the agricultural enclosures, but by something really important. That is the artisans. Well, there's an important story to tell about India here, but I don't have time. The artisans who were driven out in a long and destructive phase, it was not just because uh, the factories were more efficient. It's because the raw materials changed. That the handloom weavers, the artisans, were not only weaving, they were weaving raw materials that they themselves produced or bought locally from their neighbors, flax and wool. The Industrial Revolution was about cotton, and cotton doesn't grow in England. So it came from India, it came from new colonies developed for this purpose in East Africa, it came from an expansion of the slave frontier and a deepening of the intensity of slavery in the Americas, especially the American South. So many cities were developed this way, workers, it was not at all interesting to the powers that be at the time what those workers ate, and so they ate some pretty bad stuff, which we can talk about. And a lot of them were colonial imports, so still sugar and tea, and then 
other stuff. Uh, so industry, I mean, so the industrial revolution has to be understood in an international way, right? Not, not just the way we've usually come to, to understand it. And then finally, once you have a whole bunch of industrial cities, and all this happened within a few decades, especially in the US after it became the first a colonial independence uh, struggle, uh, was you got agro-industry. You got an agro-industrial city, Chicago was the prototype, and it took industry to a new phase. Uh, in terms of the organization through railways, of the transport, the storage in elevators, uh, the shipment to um, the, the various cities of the world. So it became a flow through city. So now agriculture is contiguous to the city, but not to feed the city, right? To feed the financial uh, mechanisms that had to grow up to serve this. So we got futures markets in the Chicago Exchange, and we got a whole, and grades of wheat, so this abstract way of looking at what the product is and categorizing it. Um, and, well, I'll just say that. Okay. So these export regions, which is what we've been talking about a lot in this conference, they were new biocultural landscapes. And I use the term biocultural um, in a way that I hope will be clear. Uh, transplanted people, plants, and animals, and the knowledge of how to grow and the tools with which to do it, simplified a landscape that had been very complex. I'll talk about the complexity in a moment. I'll just say now that this transplantation of a simple triad of European settlers, uh, cattle, old world cattle, European West cattle, and wheat, uh, were a triad that replaced an existing triad that was much more complex. And because of that, and because they were on pieces of land that were not organized around waterways or other historic ways of transporting uh, bulky items, uh, they were completely dependent on buying and selling, and the railway corporations that recruited them, the governments that formed, like Canada in 1867, Australia a little bit later, and so on, that those national and expansive governments that were helping to subsidize the railways and the settlement, that they set people up in conditions where they had to produce commercially and in a monocultural way. Uh, and they, again, they replaced complex landscapes, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a, late, in a moment, but let me just talk about how Chicago grew up. And now I'm drawing on a wonderful environmental historian I can't recommend too highly, uh, William Cronin, many of you will know him. One point he makes is that there was nothing natural about Chicago becoming the center of this reorganization of the American Plains. Uh, in, this is how it looked in 1820. It had been right in the center of the French, vast French colony, New France, that went all down the Mississippi River from the, um, the Atlantic through uh, Montreal and what we now, now is French Canada, through Detroit, which was Detroit, the Narrows, um, all down uh, to the Caribbean and New Orleans and that major port. And that land was um, occupied, and Chicago was one of many settlements that were trading centers, mainly by indigenous and Métis, or mixed uh, indigenous and French uh, settlers through the fur trade, uh, a variety of things we can look at. Just to emphasize this, St. Louis, also on the Mississippi and a little further south, was a much more likely candidate if you were just looking at what was likely at the time. But there were a group of what Cronin calls boosters who managed to convince the railways and real estate, the new real estate entrepreneurs, uh, to make it Chicago. And once it starts, then it's path dependent. So Chicago uh, re was a place where wheat trade and wheat production were completely reorganized as throughput systems. So instead of the farmer being known, because his name was on the bag, when it arrived through transshipment into ever larger boats down to New Orleans through the Mississippi and up to Boston or New York or across the ocean, that 
those bags were now turned into an abstract homogeneous quantity organized by grades. So they were put into railway cars, into well, first into elevators, these new ways of storing. Uh, there was a whole new profession organized around grading them. They get to Chicago. They're put in ever bigger ones. There's deals made about futures markets and so on. They're put onto more railway cars, and it's a flow-through system, which he calls, Cronin calls, rivers of wheat. Uh, similarly, um, tides of flesh. So the cattle were after a phase of the cowboys that you may have seen movies about, but that was a short phase, uh, that and began with organizing, driving those cattle to Chicago, where they were for the first time put in enormous pens and fed there, and then slaughtered in industrial operations, the first disassembly lines. This was not what Henry Ford invented for the car. This was a system, a conveyor system where workers stood at every place and uh, took the animal apart. And it depended on refrigerated rail cars and ships. And that's um, a new way of organizing beef. Now, what did it displace? It displaced a complex biocultural landscape. So one of the things we, many of the people at this, I don't know who's in the audience exactly now, but the people who've been at the conference have talked a lot about is the Great Plains. And what was of course on the Great Plains, as, as many of us keep mentioning, is perennial grasses. That's the heart of this conference. Perennial grasses that, um, uh, they had over 30 million, bison who grazed it, and there were indigenous people who managed that as a giant pasture, using fire, part of which was natural, part of which was induced, to, to um, keep the prairies there, the buffalo or the bison trampled the grasses, they pooped on them, and uh, everything was kind of sustainable. And when horses came up from South America, uh, where they'd escaped from the Spaniards, uh, they were adapted into this ecosystem. So it's a way that we shouldn't imagine that things are static before colonization. They evolved, uh, but they evolved on the basis of the framework that was already there. Now, because of this way of organizing settlement around the railways and a new way of organizing land and landscapes, the grasslands became the only commercially important ways to grow wheat. So that's what we depend on now. After World War II, this was spread to the newly independent countries of the former colonies of England, France, uh, Holland, and so on. Um, there were new rules that are very complex, and I won't go into all of them. I'm just going to list them and invite you to look into them. Martial aid to Europe uh, after World War II, it was 40% food, feed, and um, fertilizer. Uh, the aid that came in was not only to feed people, it was to help uh, or to encourage the transformation of European agriculture to a more industrial model using chemical and mechanical inputs. Um, martial aid got transmuted through a variety of complicated uh, mechanisms and geopolitical changes into Public Law 480, the famous food aid legislation, which was mostly wheat and mostly done through the monetary system, the Bretton Woods system, which put the US dollar at the center. There's a lot of stories to tell about that, but the outcome was to convert people, sometimes directly in the occupied territories like Japan, to wheat consumption, which they hadn't had before, sometimes in places where they never ate wheat, to start eating wheat, and whether they ate it before or not, to depend on highly subsidized imports. The idea was that farmers weren't important, uh, and the only point was to get the right number in the right pace into the cities to industrialize. That was the idea at the time, and it's one we can see evolved to be presently in China, another story. Uh, the important thing about the American system of domestic subsidies and export subsidies, which food aid was, uh, is, I mean, it might have been other things too, and I'm not talking about intentions exactly, but it was, in effect, dumping. 
and the it was it required the U.S. to exempt and to invite all of the other people in these various international organizations to agree to exempt agriculture from all of the rules. So under the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the specific section uh, that's relevant, it's very pretty easy to read, unlike the World Trade Organization, which requires teams of lawyers, um, it exempts agriculture, nothing else in this, including the intention to remove tariffs on everything else uh, applies to agriculture. Uh, the common agricultural policy was very important because Europe had been the main source of imports, import demand for U.S. grain, but, um, and it was allowed to protect its grain, and not only allowed, encouraged, because this, by exempting the, from the trade rules, it meant every country had to try to create its own system in what it could, but the trade-off was you will not um, prohibit, the common agricultural policy will not prohibit imports of maize. And there was encouragement through the Marshall Aid and then onwards, the common agricultural policy was the first, well after the coal and steel, was one of the first uh, parts of the formation of the European community that uh, it was to uh, encourage industrialization of livestock production. So what we have are not just some abstract idea of things just happen, but they happen through changing power fields and changing economic or political economic uh, fields and relationships. So what we have is um, an idea now that we form out of our experience without knowing this history, that these areas, especially the US, are the breadbaskets of the world, that they are the most efficient producers, and other countries have basically been sacrificed. And there's a bit of a change here in the last 20 years as uh, land is being, as Africa and other places are being treated as the settler colonies were before, same language, same practices of taking land, treating it be, as being either empty or inefficiently used. Uh, but that's what we now consider to be normal, that countries are dependent on imports and that um, the places that we must export from, we being the human species in this sentence. Uh, now, now we can return to the next phase in monoculture. The first one was sugar, second one was wheat, the third one that started massively after World War II was intensive livestock. And what that did, feeding back into, as it were, feeding back into the landscape, is it created the landscapes we now see in North America, and I've sadly seen even a little tiny bit of this in France, of all places, uh, massive landscapes covered, as, as Wes told us the other day, with corn and soybeans. And most of that, more than half of that, is used to feed animals. And when the extra surplus, because it remains subsidized in multiple ways, goes to biofuels. So we've had massive simplifications in waves, and now we get to palm oil, which only happened in the 1890s, sorry, 1990s. Um, and the deforestation went with that, that grew up with a new power in the food system, which is supermarkets and um, the degradation of diets and the in inequality of income that produced really massively different class diets. So this kind of food for the poor. And this has affected our way of thinking, our language. So what do we mean by food in a phrase like food crisis? First food crisis was 1974. Then we have had a couple of others, 2008 most recently. The financial mechanisms that produce those food crises are important, but we'll just start with the definition. It's a financial definition of food. What we mean by a food crisis is the prices of certain commodities, a handful of commodities, have gone up. We're not talking about price of broccoli or aubergine, right? We're talking about wheat, soy, maize, rice, um, and palm oil now, and maybe cotton. Put a couple in there. Uh, this is a chart from Olivier de Schutter, a bright light, uh, former UN special rapporteur on the right to food. Um, after he stopped being special rapporteur, he did wonderful things, including expand the right to food to the right to a sustainable agro-ecosystem. Totally brilliant uh, and visionary. Uh, we'll see how it works. But now he is 
head of international, intergovern no, international panel of experts. It's a non-governmental foundation funded organization. This is an article he wrote in Foreign Policy, or from it, and it's a chart just showing in terms of the width of the band and the color of the band, the major flow of commodities that are internationally traded, which is what we mean by food. And if you think that's what food is, just consider for a second that you cannot go into a restaurant and ask for food. You cannot go into a store and ask for food. Food is a very abstract idea. You have to say pizza or pasta carbonara or something, right? Tortilla. Uh, so we have to unpack a lot of the material as well as the financial abstractions. So that's where we are. Where might we go? There's so many emergent phenomena everywhere. Everywhere I go, everywhere you go, they produce food in some way, grow it, they prepare it, they serve it. Now we have diasporas bringing food all over the world. The movement of people and plants continues, and it continues both in this monocultural way and also in what I call um, increasingly biocultural ways, that people are moving and recreating agroecosystems, that is gardens, if they can get the land, and cuisines, and adapting them all over the world. Uh, and they're experimenting in social experiments. I'll just mention a couple, but it's wonderful to go and experience the whole range of them. So one of the things that happened in this monocultural set of successive stages was that a whole lot of crops that people grew as subsistence crops, and still do, became what have become in the lingo orphan crops. That is, because they're not traded, uh, or not traded largely, because local and regional markets are being pushed aside by the deepening of these corporate and financial and retail, like the supermarket supply chains. Because of all that, these other crops that used to be and still are to some extent the subsistence base of many cultures have, been called, have become orphans and now we have as part of the revival at every level including bio, uh, biodiversity and international organization an attempt to revive them and to commercialize them in a smaller way in a way that respects small farms and takes them on a different path to becoming larger, more successful economically than the monocultural one. Another way that's very important, it's about land, it's about seeds. How to learn to live in each place, which is a way of, a different way of moving people and plants from the monocultural big system way. So here's just a couple of examples. Um, one of my favorite organizations I was on the board is uh, Unitarian Service Committee Canada. It's now changed its name to Seed change um, that supports small farmers to have seed banks in villages in different parts of the world and has very um, positive partner relations with them. Another example is I was just at, I just spent a time at University of British Columbia with people connected to the University of British Columbia farm, many farms in the U.S., uh, many universities in the U.S now have farms, um, as <laughs> our, our uh, chair today knows. Um, this is a part of that farm. People who were refugees from Central America uh, brought their maize seeds with them. Now, maize seeds had come to North America, we don't, I don't know how long ago, but long before colonial contact. But now the se seeds are being brought again, seeds that need to be transplanted and adapted if they are to grow in uh, the west coast of Canada, uh, and they are finding some of them that work. So this farm is supporting them to, to develop those. So we're reviving the ancient movement of people and seeds. Um, one thing that I will point to is the Open Source Seed Initiative. I didn't say it, but it's really important that the patenting of seeds that became legal and an important practice in the 1990s and onwards is now being met by something uh, modeled on open source software responding to the same corporate control and legal control. And 
I can just recommend that you look into the Open Source Seed Initiative. I try to put uh, websites on when I can. And of course, the international organization, CIMIT, uh, for instance, is have seed banks, and these are important ways to preserve things. Now, one thing I just will say here, and this is especially to the scientists I've been listening to, that it's really important um, to measure what matters. Um, now, again, I'm coming back to Olivier de Schutter and IPES Food. Uh, this is a report of theirs that came out three years ago from Uniformity to Diversity. And one of the recommendations, I think there's 10, uh, in their report on how to move from this monocultural system on one side and the marginalized small farmers on the other is to take two different paths to the same goal, which is mixed farming systems and diverse landscapes uh, that are geared to feeding people in a healthy way. And one of the pieces is about measurement. And um, I've been very upset <laughs> sometimes about productivity measurements because I've tried this out on agricultural economists and I say, well, you know, if you take everything out of a field except rice, uh, even if you don't have special seeds and even if you don't have tube wells or anything else, you're gonna have a higher yield of rice. You just will, right? <laughs> that's all that's there compared to before. Uh, it means also, though, that the people who are pushed off that land now have to buy in markets, and the lentils that used to be produced in that field are now more expensive in the market than the rice was, and the diets of those people will be degraded, even before they start eating uh, plastic-wrapped, um, palm oil-saturated industrial food. So what we need to do is stop thinking about calories, yields, Productivity per worker, as Wes said, we need to get more people on the farm. We need knowledge-intensive farming. Uh, we need skilled labor. And stop measuring it in terms of income. And start measuring it in terms of the real material and energetic goals that we have. Um, and of course, another emergent phenomenon I have to mention is uh, the, the Land Institute and the attempt to make agriculture perennial. I think it is one and a very important one of the range of activities that is happening. And one of the things we need to consider, and I think uh, John had said this yesterday, is whether the balance of grains and meat and other things um, that we have presently are ones that we want to encourage to stay with. Um, you can say a lot more about that. So I'm just gonna say a few words about governance and uh, talk about my bioregion. That seems to be popular here. So I come from the Great Lakes bioregion, like some of you, and this is a picture from space of one of the largest uh, systems of fresh water in the world. And this is the line that goes through the largest of those lakes, which divides the United States from Canada. And as John had mentioned yesterday, there has been a commission to try to regulate this. But basically, it's a problem. And one of the solutions, it's a very small one, but it's one I'm happy to be connected with, is something called the Great Lakes Commons, which very much takes the lead with an, a resurgent uh, culture, law, um, uh, complex set of practices of indigenous people and an encounter that is not hostile. It's very dialogic, very conversational so far, but I'm gonna give you a conflictual part in a moment. It has a Mohawk uh, page and several other pages. We, the people of the Great Lakes, love and depend upon our waters to sustain our lives, our communities, and all life in our ecosystem. And it is very active on both sides of the border. So the question is how to reshape land and landscapes I'm going to give you now a more conflictual uh, example from the same uh, place, <laughs> which is uh, Ontario, uh, which is the largest, uh, and it's on the Great Lakes, the largest part of uh, province in Canada. So we have a legal system that's gone through layers since settlement. Uh, Canada and uh, Ontario have particular laws that were that grew out of settlement, but that includes, I should say, that includes treaties that were broken or to some extent fulfilled partially with indigenous people. In this case, what's gonna be relevant is the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which has a lineage of chiefs that they still recognize, many of whom are women. Uh, but 
In contrast to that, and in conflict with that in this case, and also oil in the West, Ca West Coast, is that in 1924, the Indian Act of the Canadian government set up band councils, which were, which were ruled in a different way. And in this case, they have a different opinion, and they're in court. They're in the Canadian court to try to settle it. This is a Mohawk woman who uh, got a piece of land out of a conflict, a land conflict, between the Ontario government and uh, the Haudenosaunee people, um, which was settled by the Premier of Ontario giving the land to the adjacent reserve, called Six Nations Reserve, um, where they don't farm much, but it's very good agricultural land, and they're starting to invite people in to help them farm. Uh, and they were farmers, but not there. <laughs> Story about the War of 1812 and how they got it. But this uh, band council wants to kick her off this land and incorporate it into the reserve. Whereas the hereditary chiefs are saying, no, the uh, government agreed, just like they agreed in the earlier treaty, 1800, uh, that um, this belongs to the band to the indigenous group whose inherited governance structure says she should have it and she should be farming on it. This is not yet resolved, but it's an example of the complex forms of governance that we have to deal with. And so I'll just end here and say that in contrast to the picture from space, which is really important, I think we need to start reconceiving of the earth as our home, as our living mother, as, as this tree suggests, perennial. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. We have four minutes for questions. When we have two microphones, one at each side. I thought I'd used up all my time so there wouldn't be any time <laughs> yeah, for questions, but no, I'm be thrilled. <laughs> There's a lot in there. Here's one. Um, your talk was very focused on North America, of course, since that's where you are, but how do you... What are your thoughts about doing this in Europe, where we don't have a short history of colonialism, but rather a longer impact, cultural impact on the landscape? What are your thoughts on that? Well, one thing I like to think is that um, people who've lived anywhere for a really long time are indigenous. <laughs> you know? And that we shouldn't be thinking of indigenous people as only the people who are displaced by colonialism in those places. And, of course, there were other kinds of colonies, like in India, uh, which were called colonies of rule and where people were reorganized in place. So there's a way that, um, to, to quote a phrase from, from our, <laughs> our kind of mentor here, uh, to become native to a place. And so there are different degrees to which you're already native to that place and uh, can uh, experience and make decisions about what should come in and how to evolve. Um, and in Europe, in most of Europe, um, things are much more continuous. And it's why, I think, um, industrial agriculture uh, and livestock production and so on, even when they've come in through powerful political forces that get translated through prices that become hard for people to resist, that despite that, there's been much more resistance and much more revival uh, through variety, through organic, through permaculture, through seed, uh, in heritage seed networks and so on, and a much more uh, continuity too of the cuisine, the cuisines. And so people appreciate or can be encouraged to appreciate that. So it, it's a matter in Europe, I would say, um, as in many parts of the world where there's been less disruption than there was in the colonial settler states. Uh, there's a way that there's more to draw on and more ability to observe, if we choose to, the forces coming in. If we don't naturalize the market or the rules that are in place at this moment that encourage certain 
uh, practices to change or to become cheaper or that sort of thing, right? I don't know, if, does that help? Okay. <laughs> Is this on? Mm -hmm. You pointed out in several places that there are subtexts and, and pretexts on which uh, international um, organizations have been involved. You mentioned, for example, the Breton, you had a slide that showed the Bretton Woods organizations and uh, the WTO and the GATT 1947 mm -hmm. and so forth. And one of the themes that seemed to run through your comments about those, uh, those organizations was that they were uh, trying to carry out sometimes um, below the surface agenda of the most powerful mm -hmm. countries at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Given that history, which I happen to agree with to a certain extent, as you, mm -hmm. as you know perhaps, um, do you see some opportunities or some hope or some prospects for international organizations of some sort to actually address some of the problems that we have today that we've been identifying during this conference and that you highlighted some, mm -hmm. in a good way? Are there some opportunities there that we should take advantage of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was hearing your talk yesterday, I was thinking about David Hell. Do you know his work? Um, he, uh, it's called uh, Democratic, uh, I, I'll have to come up with it later. Uh, but there was a project all over Europe about trying to reform the UN in the early 1990s when it was a much more hopeful time, the end of the Cold War, and we didn't know. We thought we'd have a peace dividend, right? And maybe we could move in. So the idea there, which I, I share that idea, it's the time has moved on, uh, is that it's all we've got. For all the problems of it, for Victor's justice after World War II, for the UN is, uh, U.S. centric for um, all the conflicts that have emerged as the independent colonies have become dominant nations in the General Assembly. You know that 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 there's so many problems in the UN and the Security Council, and yet, and yet, it's all we've got at the moment. Now I, I could say, well, maybe it's in the way. That's the question we always have to ask about institutions: is in the way of something better. Uh, but uh, it's also, for instance, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Committee on Food Security has the most um, elaborate inclusion of civil society, which has been growing in the 90s everywhere. So the Civil Society Mechanism, a wonderful book by Nora McKeon called Global Food Governance that talks about how that civil society mechanism has worked and brought in massive social movements, the food sovereignty movement, you know, organizations that are all around the world. Um, so, yes, I, I think there are spaces. Every institution has cracks. <laughs> you know, every institution is locked in to some path-dependent set of ideas and practices, and yet they're so complicated and elaborate that there are spaces that can be opened up. Now, whether those are ultimately the form, I don't know. I'm, I'm not as uh, sophisticated or knowledgeable as you are about the specific structures and possibilities of the various institutions that are part of the United Nations. Uh, and yet, um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. But um, I would say, because I didn't get to finish that sentence before, that when I show those pictures of the Great Lakes, what I'm imagining, and I hope this will help people uh, to imagine it with me, is that if we focus mainly on the hydrosphere and the biosphere, and we're part of all of the four, <laughs> but if we focus on those two, and if we think about all the water in the world, as being very specific in each place, in every stream, in every lake, in every path of flowing to the ocean or up into the atmosphere and back down or into the ground. Uh, if we think of that as a model for how we would organize nested and overlapping institutions of governance, then we might have a goal toward which we could aspire and through which we could evaluate the positive or negativity of the different pathways that we have to choose in the present for each thing. So I, I love the idea of human society becoming like the hydrosphere or modeling ourselves on it. And the one institution that I know of that 
has some pieces that would complement that is subsidiarity as the basis in the European Union. That is that you try to regulate each thing at the lowest possible scale where it's possible. So we all have to agree on the atmosphere, but we have to remember too that every piece of carbon that goes into the atmosphere is produced in one place. Right? And so everybody's responsible and that we shouldn't think of scales as vertical but more as concentric circles. Right? That how, how widely uh, things uh, need to be regulated. Okay, thank you very much. Well, Sorry. I think we have to <laughs>